Some movement in the women's featherweight division. Former IBF featherweight champion Sarah Mafood of Denmark will be taking on Italy's own Veronica Tosi. Later on this month, on the 26th, Veronica sports a professional record of four wins with one loss, no draws, to Sarah Mafood, who sports a professional record of 12 wins with one loss. The obviously more experienced fighter of the two, the former champion. Keeping busy, staying active, staying sharp. She needs to, because it won't be long before one of the major promotional outfits give her a call. Whether it's Queensberry on behalf of Raven Chapman right. or Sky Sports and Boxer on behalf of Karis Artingstall right. should she make it through her next fight. Perhaps Vazerman on behalf of Sophia Leash or Matchroom on behalf of Sky Nicholson. Interesting particulars in association with this fight. In Sarah Mafood's last fight opposite the ring Lara Ochman who I picked her to beat, picked her to beat Lara on points. points. There was a WBC silver title on the line. That title doesn't appear to be on the line in this fight is it possible that sarah dropped it and why would she have dropped it so soon after winning it been a lot of funny business going on with that title you know initially sky nicholson won the wbc silver title i believe it was in the tania alvarez fight but in her very next fight the title went vacant at which point sarah mafood picked it up she won it now it looks like she dropped it perhaps it's because that title brings you closer to an amanda serrano fight and sarah mafood she already fought amanda she already lost to amanda and she has since rebounded off that loss with Lara Ochman. She's going to be fighting Victoria Tosi next. Victoria, who debuted as a professional in November of 2019, late 2019. Missed out all of 2020. Came back and fought two times in 2021, just oh. once in 2022. And she last saw action in February of this year. This will be her second fight of this year. She lost a majority decision in a 10-rounder opposite the ring, Michaela Braga. An unbeaten up-and-comer in the women's featherweight division. This fight with Sarah is a considerable step up in class from that fight from that fighter so veronica has seen action at least once this year the same applies to sarah mafood she is in action in march of this year opposite the ring lara ochman it's good of her team to keep her busy and keep her active we are going to have to give veronica tosi a closer look but you do get the sense that this is another lara ochman kind of opponent another lara ochman kind of fight a winnable fight it reads like a tick over fight a keep busy fight in between now and the time that one of the major promotional outfits decide to give Sarah a call to perhaps face one of their unbeaten up and comers or or perhaps if a world title opportunity should be made available. Amanda Serrano holds all the belts at this weight so I don't actually think we're on the eve of that. It could be that Sarah is just biding her time until I don't know perhaps Amanda Serrano moves up in weight and drops those belts or retires. Sarah Mafood could be biding her time until such a time as that happens That's how this reads set to return to action later on this month on the 26th and she's not alone germany's own nina menke will be returning to action next month on the 24th nina menke who's been in there with some of the very best fighters the last couple of years she shared the ring with katie taylor shared the ring with sarah mafood who we just talked about nina's won some fights she's lost some fights she like sarah mafood is currently campaigning as a featherweight. Featherweight, that's 126 pounds. That's where Amanda Serrano reigns as that division's undisputed champion. I don't actually think Nina is interested in challenging Amanda for what she's got. Nina, who sports a professional record of 16 wins with three losses, no draws, four knockouts, having only ever been knocked out once, just once in 19 professional bouts. That lone knockout came at the hands of Katie Taylor years ago at the start of Katie Taylor's career up there at lightweight. After that loss, Nina Menke made her way south of lightweight. Moved down in weight and she's currently campaigning as a featherweight. She has been for a while now. We don't yet know who she's going to be fighting. Her next fight isn't registered on Box Rack. So you don't get the sense it's going to be a high-profile opponent because of the promotion. It's not a Vazerman show, not a boxer show, not Queensbury, not Matchroom. It's not a major promotional outfit promoting this show. Seems to be a German-based outfit, a local one. Nina Menke has got the right idea. The same applies to Sarah Mafood. These seasoned fighters that have been around the block, the smartest thing they can do now is keep busy, keep active, and stay sharp. Nina Menke's team have done 
done a very good job of keeping her busy and keeping her active. In spite of having suffered a loss last year in April to Sarah Mafood, she's already fought four times since then. She had a grand total of four fights last year, and she's already had one fight in March of this year. A tickover fight. A rematch with Angelina Canizaro, who she already fought and already beat in late 2020. She fought her again earlier this year, and I understand uh, that the rematch was unnecessary. Staying busy was. Keeping busy is a necessary evil. Should she receive a phone call to fight some young unbeaten up-and-comer, you don't want to have to be shaken off ring rust to do it. Because the fight only lasted two rounds. It's all the more reason to schedule another fight as soon as you can. Don't let dust collect. The proliferation of talent at 126 pounds makes it a particularly hostile environment. You gotta stay on your toes, stay on your P's and Q's, cross all the T's, dot all the I's. Early to bed and early to rise. Always prepared, not caught by surprise. That rhymed. Best thing Nina Menke can do is keep herself busy to keep herself sharp, and it appears that's what she's going to be doing next month. Keep your eyes peeled for that. Men's Super Middleweight News, Farl Crotch says, I think Canelo is past his best. Bivol will win the rematch. Most people aren't giving Canelo a chance to win that second fight, whether it's at 168 or 175. Did Canelo Alvarez hit a wall? Has he peaked already and there's nowhere else to go but down? Is that what we're looking at? I thought Canelo fought a very good world-level fighter in John Ridier, but he's not quite top-tier level. Aww. You grade fighters on world level, British level and European level, where you're ranked top 10 in the world, and then you think, is he good enough to step up to world level, which is about timing and who the champions are. I always thought Ryder was a good world level fighter. He's good enough to compete, which he proved by going the distance, Frotch explained to Intent. I think Canelo is past his best, which everyone knows, uh -huh. but it's about levels, basically. I think Ryder is at that level in the super middleweight division, but I don't think he's big enough. I think he's a middleweight, even light middleweight. He's quite small. Canelo is small as well, but Ryder really took it to him. Great performance, and you can't ask for more. I think people are overanalyzing the fight. It's a fight where Canelo Alvarez won all of 10, maybe 11 rounds. Scored two knockdowns, only one officially, but we know what we saw. Hit John Ryder in the jaw. Broke his nose in the first three. I think people are over-scrutinizing Canelo Alvarez's performance because they expect flames to shoot out of his eyes and sparks to shoot out of his ass. When you compare how Canelo looked with John Ryder to how other fighters looked with John Ryder. It's not like any of these fighters are having it all their way with this guy, whether you're talking about Callum Smith, Danny Jacobs, or Zach Parker. It's not like people are going in there and smacking up John Ryder. Nope. Having it all their way, quite the opposite. He's a characteristically difficult guy to deal with, but Canelo dealt with him easy. Like I said, he won 10 or 11 rounds, knocked the guy down two times, then broke his nose. What do you want? You want he should punch the guy's head clean off his shoulders in the first round. That's what you're waiting for. That's what it sounds like. Farl Crotch continued, I think Bivol wins if it happens. When you look at the last time they fought, Bivol was really busy, fresh, strong, and powerful. He's a natural light heavyweight. I remember watching him in Monaco early in his career. I remember thinking, wow, he's one to swerve. He's dangerous. When the Canelo fight was made, I thought he fought Kovalev at light heavyweight, but this fight, he's going to struggle, and he got hammered. Carl Frotch isn't giving Canelo Alvarez much chance to exact revenge in a rematch. Neither is his former promoter, Oscar De La Coca. Ow. Oscar says Canelo will never beat Bivol at 175, 168. It's even more dangerous for Alvarez. More dangerous? Call me crazy. He'll never beat Bivol at 175 pounds, that's for sure. Former Alvarez promoter Oscar De La Hoya told BoxingScene.com in an interview, at 168, it might be even more dangerous for him because I think Bivol will be even lighter on his feet. He'll be faster. So it's a difficult situation that Canelo is in. The next fight that he takes has to be very strategic. We'll see what his brilliant promoter, Eddie Hearn, does for him. You guys know how I feel about it. I don't think he should run it back with Dimitri. I think he should pursue David Benavidez. I think he should pursue Demetrius Andre, maybe Jermall Charlo. So many are trying to shame Canelo Alvarez for losing that fight to Dimitri Bivol while glorifying fighters that don't have Canelo's cojones. Glorifying fighters that wouldn't dare set foot in the light heavyweight division, but Canelo's done it twice, and he's smaller than them. The cowards. So Oscar is right. Eddie Hearn has his work cut out for him. Eddie Hearn, who says, if we can't get him Dimitri Bivol, I'm sure he'll talk to other people. Now, why would he not be able to get him Dimitri Bivol? Because Dimitri wants to fight at 168 for Canelo's belts, whereas Canelo wants it at 175 for Dimitri's. We've talked about that. 
We've got the fight in September that we're planning, Hearn told IFL TV. If we can't deliver a Dimitri Bivol fight, we'll present him with other options. If we can't get him Dimitri Bivol or if he doesn't like his other options, I'm sure he'll talk to other people. So we have to deliver what he wants, as always. It's not a case of Canelo, you're fighting this person. No. Him and Eddie Reynoso come to me and say, this is what we want you to do. And that instruction was clear. John Ryder and Dimitri Bivol. We talked in the changing room after the fight on Saturday. The instructions were exactly the same. Ryder's now been ticked. Now we have to try and make the Dimitri Bivol fight. Talks are ongoing. Dimitri doesn't have a lot of options. He ain't got an alternative to a Canelo fight. The Canelo rematch would likely do better business than the first fight did because in the second fight, unlike the first, Canelo Alvarez's reign, it hangs in the balance. Reign is the face of boxing. Some feel that reign is coming to an end based on that first b-ball fight and how he's looked since then. Boxing insider Rick Glacier. He's got a figure. He's got a number. Rick Glacier says the Canelo versus Ryder pay-per-view barely broke 200,000 pay-per-view buys. That's a big reflection of the DAZN consumer fallout with the Davis versus Garcia technical problems in regards to payment and some actually not being able to view it. In DAZN's very poor public response to the situation, in other words, consumer confidence in DAZN is at a very low level. Now DAZN needs to do something that would please their boxing subscribers and do it quickly. The Canelo fight was a financial bloodbath for DAZN and it was their own fault. Consumer confidence is very important, especially nowadays with social media. The zone can do better, and it must to stay in business. Well, you're telling me that fight only did 200,000 pay-per-view buys. I'm not telling you anything. Rick's telling you that. Whether or not you want to believe it is up to you. I will say that Rick Glacier's number may only be a partial number because his inside source reports on cable and satellite buys. What about digital? Canelo vs. Ryder was made available by way of two separate distributors. Pay-per-view.com for those not subscribed to DAZN and obviously the DAZN platform for existing subscribers. I'm not completely sure. I'm not convinced that that 200,000 buys is all the pay-per-view did. Though short of DAZN themselves coming forward and making an official press release like they did when it came to the Golovkin trilogy. Where everybody was saying that the pay-per-view tank, the zone themselves confirmed it did over a million buys. Unless they come forward for this and do a press release in regards to this fight like they did for that one, it's all subject to speculation and Rick's number is the only number that's out there. Nobody else is ballparking it, just Rick. Is it possible that on the heels of technical issues during the Garcia versus Davis fight and no real demand for Canelo to face the likes of John Ryder, is it possible that the pay-per-view performed this badly. I'm not convinced. I'm not. At the very most, I believe that Rick's number is a partial number, a partial figure that may not factor in digital buys. Most of these boxing insiders and their sources, they don't have the inside track on the zone. They can talk about a showtime, they can talk about an ESPN. But who's your source at the zone? Who's tipping you off? Joe Markowski? Eddie Hearn? At a time when Dan Raphael was reporting low pay-per-view numbers for the Canelo versus Golovkin trilogy, it was the zone themselves that came forward and corrected him. Because like I said, nobody's got the inside track on them. Your inside sources may be hip to cable and satellite buys by way of a premium cable company like a Showtime, but the zone. You've got the inside track at the zone. Who do you know at the zone? It's hard to conjure. In any event, irrespective of what the pay-per-view did, Canelo Alvarez does have a tough decision to make. Do you really want to run it back with Dimitri Bivol, or do you just stay at super middleweight and defend your undisputed crown against David Benavidez, against Dimitri Demetrius Andre and Jermall Charlo. Fight those bums. Does this herald Canelo Alvarez's return to the Schmo Time platform? Losers. To fight their assembly line of fuck ups and clout chasers. And he did say that if they can't provide Canelo with a B Vol fight, he's sure that he would talk to other people. Could those other people be the people over there at the PBC? Their inferior brand of boxing. John Ryder, immediately after the fight, after having shared the ring with Canelo Alvarez, came to the conclusion that Canelo is past his best, that he's in decline. Which I imagine is music to some people's ears because they're waiting on his downfall, hoping that someone may usurp him as the face of boxing in this country. They are dissatisfied with the matchmaking they get from Canelo Alvarez, and they would like for the face of boxing to be someone else. Is that right? Ryder said he was very good, but I think he's past his best, but he still had enough in his tank tonight. Why is he?
he passed his best? Because he couldn't get me out of there. His plan was to stop me, and he didn't. I know I took a great shot in the fifth round, but I came back swinging and had some good rounds after that. Ryder also revealed that his nose, which bled profusely for much of the fight, was broken as early as the second round. And this is the guy you're telling me is past his best. The guy who broke your nose as early as the second round. Then I'll tell you what. What? Two things can be true at the same time. Canelo Alvarez may very well be past his best. He might be. But he doesn't need to be at his very best to beat the best of the rest. Manny Pacquiao didn't. Manny was 40 years old when he beat Keith Thurman and took his WBA title. He was clearly past his best. Yeah. Clearly past his prime. Yeah. But he was still better than that guy. George Foreman in the Michael Moorer fight. Guy in his 40s. Clearly past his best. Clearly past his prime, but still better than that guy. Still good enough. John Ryder added, I felt it go instantly, and the blood in the back of my throat, it threw me for a couple of rounds, but it is what it is. It's a new experience in the boxing ring, and something I'll learn from. I think it's broken. And if the nose didn't go in the second round, it probably would have been a different fight. Despite the defeat, Ryder earned a lot of respect due to the gutsy nature of his performance, but he says that the response does little to ease the pain of his sixth career defeat. He said coming away with a win was the ultimate goal. Going the distance isn't. I made a fight of it for a while, but on the scorecards it wasn't close. Moral victory? Maybe, yeah. But I came here with a dream, and I didn't achieve it. I'm just gutted. I've put so much into the sport over the last few years, and haven't always got the rub of the green. I came here with a dream, but I fell short. That's boxing. And as stated, Canelo being in decline is gonna sound like music to some people's ears because they want someone to replace him. They want someone to usurp him. The problem is... Who meets the consumer's needs and the consumer's demands? more than Canelo. I mean, really think about it. The big fights that he's been in, the consistent track record of big fights like the Mayweather fight, the Cotto fight. The numbers he brought in with Amir Khan are better than the vast majority of numbers most other fighters bring in today at the box office. So if we're entertaining the possibility of someone usurping him, who's it gonna be? It's not gonna be Errol. The buy rate for his pay-per-views has only gone down since he debuted on pay-per-view. His best bet for a big fight is the Crawford fight, but after that, left after that in Errol's own words he was here for a good time but not a long one so who's gonna usurp Canelo if it's not Errol who's it gonna be Javante Davis he doesn't have the track record of fighting in big fights consistently fighting in big fights that the fight fans want to see big fights like Canelo fights in big fights like the Mayweather fight the Cotto fight hell even the Khan fight Javante Davis has only ever fought in one big fight just one big fight and that was his last fight with Ryan Garcia how many more fights like that is he gonna be in he sold over a million buys with the fight Congratulations, Canelo Alvarez did that three times with three fights Against the same guy Against Gennady Golovkin Every single one of those fights did just over a million buys To beat a face of boxing, this is what has to happen Can Javante Davis make that happen? Does he want to? I don't think so